Cool. We're going to talk about a number of aqueous reactions now. And the first one we're going to spend a significant number of time on. So first of all, what's an aqueous reaction? A reaction that takes place in water. Yeah, a reaction that takes place in water. A reaction in which water is the solvent where it takes place. And the first type we'll talk about is a double displacement reaction. What is a double displacement, sometimes called double replacement reaction? So everything switches. <laughs> Yeah, so and typically this involves either you know two ionic compounds or maybe like an ionic compound, an acid, also can throw it in the mix. If you notice the one I've got on your handout here, I've got lead nitrate, and I mix that with sodium iodide. Now on your handout, I've already worked out what this forms, but let's say we had to predict the products here, and then balance. So in this case, double displacement or double replacement. So cations and anions trade partners. What's a cation? Positive ion, what's an anion? Negative ion, so I've got cation, anion. Cation, anion, they're gonna trade partners. So in this case. So who is lead gonna end up with? Iodine, and what's lead's oxidation state or charge right here? Well, what's nitrate's charge? Negative one, but there's two of them for a total of negative two, so lead must be plus two. And then iodide? Negative one, so if lead is plus two, and iodine's minus one, what should be the proper formula here for lead two iodide? PBI2, awesome. And then in this case, sodium and nitrate will end up together in the products. And what's the charge on sodium? Plus one and nitrate. Ooh, again, on a single nitrate, we always look at them one at a time. So it's minus one. So in the proper formula, if sodium is plus one and nitrate's minus one, the proper formula has them in a one-to-one -one ratio. So just the fact that there's two over here doesn't mean I'm gonna end up with two over here. Same thing here, just because there's only one iodine here doesn't mean I'm only gonna end up with one here. It's all about charges. I need to make sure that the cation and anion are balanced in terms of charge. If lead's plus two and iodine's minus one, well then I need two iodides to balance out the ionic compound formula. Cool. From here, so the reactants are aqueous. Now on your handout, I already gave you the phases here, but how would you figure out what the phases are here, solid or aqueous? I uh, wouldn't even use that. We're gonna look up the solubility rules, which I didn't put on your handout. I'm gonna assume you guys know how to use those. You're gonna to wanna to spend some time learning how to use those. So if we look up sodium nitrate, you'll find out that anyone with a group one salt or any ionic compound with a nitrate are gonna be soluble. So either way, you would have figured out this guy's soluble. And if he's soluble, what does that mean is his phase? Aqueous. Lead iodide. You look up lead iodide, you'll find out that most of your iodides are. So most of the iodides are actually soluble, but lead's an exception. So he is insoluble and therefore a solid. Cool. But again, I already gave that to you. So this we'd call the complete reaction. Some people would call it the molecular reaction, but these aren't molecular compounds. I don't like calling it that. So a question. Yeah, uh, oh, we are going to balance that. We're also going to go forth and make the ionic equation and the net ionic equation as well. Question? So, because it's insoluble. So notice most compounds with iodide are soluble, but he's an exception. So lead, silver, and mercury one are exceptions to that rule. So if most of the compounds are soluble and are aqueous, but if he's an exception, that means he's insoluble. So, and it's not just because lead is a metal. If you look at the solubility rules, it says most of the time you see an I, soluble, but not him. The rule actually says it. So it tells you that lead, silver, and mercury one, they're exceptions. And so if most of them are soluble, then an exception means insoluble. And just write off the rules, read, read it. So most of the time you see iodide, like sodium iodide, you're like, oh, soluble, aqueous. If I saw potassium iodide, aqueous. If I saw barium iodide, aqueous. But all of a sudden I see lead iodide, silver iodide, or mercury one iodide, and they're gonna be insoluble and be solids. Cool, but again, comes straight from the solubility rules. Not something we can just like, ah, I think things with PB should be solids. Not something we're to get that. It's right off the solubility rules. So how do I balance this? Two in front of the what? Awesome. Put a two there. That balances out my nitrates. So now the nitrates are good, but that gives me two sodium. So put a two here, but now that gives me two iodides. I've got two iodides, one lead, one lead. We're good to go. But again, that was already balanced on your handout anyways. But if it hadn't been, with given two ionic compounds, you should realize, oh, double displacement reaction. 
You should be able to predict the products with their proper formulas and be able to balance the equation. But now we have to talk about what's really going on here. The double displacement reaction, this is really a bad name for it. In fact, this reaction has four different names. We said double displacement, double replacement. What are the other two names that sometimes get thrown in the mix a little less commonly? Exchange reactions is sometimes used. And then the one that not so commonly used, but metathesis or metathesis, you'll hear it said both ways. I actually don't know the correct pronunciation here. So, but all of those mean the same thing. You should realize that name. Double displacement, double replacement, exchange, or metathesis, all four names are on your handout. Cool, if we look at what's really going on, when I see like lead nitrate aqueous, what does that actually mean? It dissolves in water. And being a soluble ionic compound, it dissolves, and being electrolyte, it dissociates. So what this really means is we've got lead ions, plus two charge, floating around our solution. We've got a couple of nitrate ions as well, floating around in our solution. So sodium iodide aqueous means the same thing. It's fully dissociated, soluble ionic compound. So in this case, we've got two sodium iodides, so that's two sodium ions and two iodide ions. So whether I write NaI aqueous or write it as separate ions, same diff, same diff. Is lead iodide a strong electrolyte? No, we only said that it's soluble ionic compounds. The insoluble ones are not strong electrolytes. This largely does not dissociate to any significant extent. It actually exists together in the solution, and we'll write it like that as a precipitate. Cool, and then finally, sodium nitrate, again, aqueous, soluble ionic compound, exists as separate ions here. And I'm running out of room. So we use this phrase, double displacement. And it makes it sound like, oh yeah, you got two couples went to a party and they traded and went home with other people and okay. So not the way it worked. What really happened is you had four separate ions going to a party together. Two of them hooked up and the other two just watched. A Little weird, I know. So because they just watched, what do we call these guys? Spectator ions. Notice sodium came to the party alone, sodium left the party alone. Nitrate came to the party alone, nitrate left the party alone. They didn't do anything at this party. They are spectators. And we will get rid of them to come up with what we call the net ionic equation here. Yeah, you, well again, do you have to write the charge on the test? No. But you need to know them. But you need to know them. Now, why don't you have to write them? Because it's a multiple choice test. <laughs> so, but you would have to actually put the charges and the correct charges in place. So, when it, on the proper, correct answer choice. Cool, so we got the original complete equation, the ionic equation, and then the net ionic equation gets rid of the spectator ions. So you may get a question that just asks you to write the net ionic equation for a certain reaction. They may just give you the reactants and you gotta predict the products, balance, and then come up with eliminating the spectators to get there. They may give you a reaction and you just say, they might just say, What's this, what are the spectator ions? And you'd have to identify, oh yeah, sodium and nitrate didn't do anything, they were spectators. So on and so forth. Cool. So in a double displacement reaction, this is the first type and we call it a precipitation reaction. How would I recognize this as a precipitation reaction? We f so, well, it didn't have to actually form an aqueous solution. As long as we form a solid. If we form two solids, that would still be precipitation. Doesn't usually work that way. But in this case, if you form a solid in a full displacement reaction, that is a precipitation reaction. So, and that's exactly what we just did right there. Your second type of double displacement reaction are gas forming reactions. There are a lot of reactions that form gases. There are only a couple types that are double displacement reactions though. So any reaction that forms either carbonic acid or sulfurous acid, H2CO3 or H2SO3. So those are not your real products. It turns out H2CO, H2CO3 spontaneously decomposes into water 
and CO2 gas. H2SO3 spontaneously decomposes into water and SO2 gas. So when you're doing a double displacement reaction, if it looks like either one of these is your product, it's not. It turns out it's just an intermediate and your real products involve forming either CO2 or SO2 gas. So for example, on your hand out there, we've got sodium carbonate, what do we put? HCl. And so in this case, double displacement reaction. So what are my products? What is it? Well, what, let's start, let's just look at what are the immediate result of double displacement? We'll worry about what the final products are in just a second, but good call. So H2CO3, two H's, CO3 is minus two, so H2CO3. And Na and Cl one to one, and we'll need two of them to balance, so two NaCl as it turns out. But the moment you realize this, you're like, oh, I just formed H2CO3, which means I didn't really form H2CO3, or at least not for very long. It immediately decomposes, and my products should really be H2O plus CO2 gas, hence the name gas forming reactions, plus NaCl. And these would really be your products. Cool. That's just something we expect you to know. What would this look like if you actually did this? You know, you poured some aqueous hydrochloric acid into aqueous sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate. If you actually poured it in there in a beaker, what would that actually look like? It would start bubbling and fizzing. So because you're forming the CO2 gas. That's what's bubbling and fizzing as it comes out of the solution. So in fact, if you use sodium bicarbonate, which is similar to sodium carbonate, and instead of using HCl, we might use acetic acid, AKA vinegar. We might put a little red food coloring in there and put it on the top of a paper mache mountain and have that volcano demo you saw back when you were probably in grade school somewhere along the way. Great. Cool, your last type of double displacement reaction, acid-based neutralizations. First thing you should know about acid-based neutralizations is they're typically exothermic. We'll talk about that in chapter five. So what does exothermic actually mean? Gives off heat. So if I did an acid-based neutralization reaction, what would the beaker feel like immediately after mixing the two? It would feel hot, exothermic, great. So if we look at a couple examples, your most famous acid-based neutralization here, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. Cool, if we do a double displacement reaction, who's gonna end up with sodium? What's that? Here. Good, and so Na is plus one, Cl is minus one, so NaCl, not the hardest thing to predict, and it's soluble, so aqueous, and then who does H end up with? OH, and what do we call HOH? H2O or water. I'm gonna call it HOH, which is a liquid, for just a minute. Yeah, I really know this is really water, and on the correct answer choice, you'd see it written as water, but I'm gonna keep it like that for just a minute. So in this one, it's easy. These react in a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's not so bad. One H for every one OH forms a water. Okay, great. If it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, though, reading this as HOH, where the H comes from the acid and the OH comes from the base, will make it easier to balance later on. We'll see an example of that in just a sec. What would be the net ionic equation here? So what's a quick way to identify our spectators in this reaction? Well, who's part of a strong electrolyte on both sides of the reaction? Is H part of a strong electrolyte on both sides of the reaction? Well, he is on this side because he's strong acid, but water is not a strong electrolyte. So he's really going to do something. He is not a spectator. What about chloride? Part of a strong acid on this side, part of a soluble ionic compound on this side. He's a spectator. If we're trying to write the net ionic, we'll get rid of him. So sodium hydroxide, so sodium, Strong electrolyte on this side and strong electrolyte on this side. He's a spectator as well. What about hydroxide? Part of a strong base over here, so strong electrolyte on this side, but again, water is not a strong electrolyte, not part of one on this side. He really does something. And so your net ionic equation here, H plus plus OH minus forms water. Let's make this a little harder on the balancing side.
So this is phosphoric acid. Is he strong or weak? You both said strong, and you've at least said weak too. And so is he one of the seven? He is not, so he's a weak acid. So he starts with H, so we know he's an acid in all likelihood, but he's not one of the seven strong acids, so he's by default weak. In this case, who does hydrogen end up with? OH. And instead of writing that as water, what am I going to write that as? No, I'm just going to write it as HOH. So H is plus 1, OH is minus 1, 1 to 1 ratio. So I'm going to write it as HOH for now. And then who's sodium going to hook up with? Phosphate. So what's sodium charge? Plus 1. What's phosphate's charge? So you think, well, if we notice, we can figure it out here, right? What's hydrogen's charge again? Plus 1. So what must he be? Minus 3. But again, that was something you're supposed to memorize for first exam. So if phosphate's minus 3, sodium's plus 1, what's the proper formula for sodium phosphate? Good, Na3PO4. All about balancing the charges again. And now we've got to balance the rest of this here. So now that we've got the proper formulas for the products, now it's all about coefficients. So in this case, I've got three H's. How do I make sure I end up with three H's from the acid on the other side? Well, that's why I wrote this like this. The acid supplies the H's in HOH. The base supplies the OH's in HOH. So if I've got three H's from the acid on this side, how am I going to make that balance on the other side? I'm going to put a big fat 3 here. But that also means I need three OHs from the base. How do I make that work? Put a 3 right here. But that gives me three sodiums. I've got three sodiums. One phosphate, one phosphate. We're balanced. So how did I get, like, how did we originally put that 3 right there? Yep. So again, what was the charge on a single sodium ion? And what did we decide was the charge on a phosphate ion? So the proper formula for sodium phosphate has to balance those out. And that's why we need a little subscript right there, 3. So the proper formula for sodium phosphate is Na3PO4, just because that's what balances out the charges. So the first thing when you're predicting your products is you first have to just get the proper formulas. Once you've got that, though, then it's all about balancing, putting in the proper coefficients after that. Cool. If. I wanted the net ionic equation. In fact, let's, instead of the net ionic, let's just identify the spectators. Because once you do that, getting the net ionic just kind of flows from there. But who are the spectator ions? Yeah, sodium's part of a strong electrolyte and a strong base on this side, and a soluble ionic compound on this side. So he's a strong electrolyte. Who else? OH is part of a strong electrolyte on this side. Is he part of a strong electrolyte on this side? He's not. That's three waters, right? Water's not a strong electrolyte. So in fact, the only strong electrolytes up here are sodium hydroxide and sodium phosphate. We usually get so used to saying aqueous means strong electrolyte. Does it always mean strong electrolyte? Aqueous means dissolved in water. And if it's an ionic compound, then it means strong electrolyte. But is this an ionic compound? No, this is an acid. And what kind of acid is this? It's a weak acid which means it's an acid that's a weak electrolyte. And we don't separate those if we're trying to write like the ionic. So he's not going to be a spectator in this case. He's not part of a strong electrolyte on both sides. He's part of a strong electrolyte on this side, phosphate, but a weak electrolyte on this side. We can't cross him out. He's not a spectator. So in this case, you know what? Let's just write the net ionic for fun. We can't separate this. He's not a strong electrolyte. We've got to keep it all together for the net ionic. We did get rid of the sodiums, but we still got three hydroxides there. Water is a strong electrolyte, so we'll leave it alone. I'll write it properly now since we've already got it balanced. And then again, we got rid of sodium, so all we've got left is phosphate. And there would be our net ionic equation. So when a weak acid is involved, this trips up a lot of students. They want to get rid of the H's or the phosphate, or they're actually usually the phosphate, not the H's. Uh, but with a weak acid, you can't separate it like that. It's not a strong electrolyte.